shortly. This is our 4-H Agronomy and Horticulture series. Uh, today is our Manure Monday part of our series. My name is Brian McNeil. I'm an Extension educator. I work with the University of Minnesota Extension and I welcome you here today with our Manure Monday. It's great to have you um, spending your afternoon with us and taking a little time to learn about some of our um, pieces that, it, that connect to our agronomy and horticulture. Um, and I think, Chris sees maybe with that, we'll get started. So again, welcome everyone. We're uh, excited to have you today with, with for our Manure Monday, part of our 4-H uh, Agronomy and Horticulture series. Again, my name is Brian McNeil. I'm part of the um, agronomy team that have been sponsoring these the last six, seven times. And we have a few more through June too. So if you are enjoying these, we welcome you to continue to be with us um, even through the month of June. Um, 4-H Youth Development Program is, uh, really empowers youth to lead with skills through a lifetime. And they do this through research-based, fun, hands-on activities in areas like science and health and agriculture, as well as civic engagement. And we like to do this with the support of a caring adult mentor. Minnesota 4-H is brought to you by the University of Minnesota Extension. And today, like I said before, we're going to learn about manure as it relates to a fertilizer. Uh, just to let everyone know, we are recording this uh, presentation today and our hope is to have this up on our 4-H Agronomy and Horticulture website in a day or two after the presentation. So if you know someone who couldn't be a part of this, um, you can send them to our 4-H Agronomy and Horticulture page and they can find the recording there. Um, I hope you've been joining us through our various agronomy and horticulture Zoom experiences. Last week we had Gardening Tip Tuesday, which we made some really neat uh, greenhouses. And the week before we learned about Worm Wednesday. And today, hopefully we'll connect right into our previous experiences. Uh, before we get started, I do want to introduce a couple people on um, our Zoom today. First, I want to start with someone who's a member of a new program for older members and it's called the Minnesota 4-H Agriculture Ambassadors. And today, Sarah Wiltz is on, and I wanna invite her to unmute and provide a little welcome to everybody today. So, Sarah? Hey guys, so my name is Sarah Wiltz. Like Brian said, I am one of the State Agriculture Ambassadors, and we're really working in this time of distance learning of everything to keep you guys learning about agronomy and agriculture. So I'm really excited to join you guys here today and learn. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for being with us. And uh, maybe down the road, if somebody has a question about the Agriculture Ambassadors, they can reach out to you and ask those questions. Thanks for being with us. My second guest, and it will be our presenter today, is Chris, Chris Moderman, and she's a University of Minnesota Extension Educator in Crops and Manure Nutrient Management. Um, and so, Chris, I'll have you just give a little intro to yourself. Hi, yes, my name is Chrissy Smoderman. Um, I know my first name's a little bit of a doozy, so I'll say it again and slowly. Chrissy, yes, I know. Um, I work for University of Minnesota Extension, focus on manure management. So my whole world revolves around manure, helping farmers um, calculate how much to apply, where to apply, where to store it on the farm, that sort of thing. I actually was a 4 H'er back in the state in Flint County in Minnesota here, so it's uh, fun and good to be back with 4 H briefly. Great, thanks, Chrissy, and look forward to the presentation in just a few minutes. Um, so for everybody participating, I will remind you to put your name, your club, and county in the chat. This is kind of a fun way for us to see who's, who's uh, participating with us today. And if you're from another state, just throw the state in that you're participating from as well. Um, there will also be a 4-H Agronomy and Horticulture team members, Kirsten, Amy, and Anya, who will be watching the chat and bringing forth your questions as we go um, throughout the afternoon. So it's great um, for everybody to join with us today. Um, I will remind you that your mics are muted and um, put your questions in the chat, please. And for today's session, 
Uh, we also keep our cameras off. Um, and like I said, we've got people monitoring the chats and they'll bring forth your questions as you throw them in the chats. So to get started here, uh, 4-H, we have a 4-H pledge and we like to start with that in front of all of our 4-H opportunities that we have. Um, this is really a great way to unite us all in 4-H. And um, the, as you think about and say the pledge, just remember it's as important today as it was when it was first developed and as it fits into our lives even today. So we're gonna do our pledge and you can follow along with me. I pledge my head to clear thinking, my heart to grow the loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my family, my club, my community, my country, and my world. Now, if you are joining us from another state, if we are fortunate to have anyone um, on today, in Minnesota, we have a different part in our pledge. We've added for my family, just before my club. And that just really indicates that we pledge ourselves to our family and really recognize them as an important piece to our society. So thank you for joining me in the pledge. Um, I've got some just reminders here before we get going. So um, remember that uh, being a part of a Zoom um, experience is just like being in face-to-face -face meetings. And we want to make sure that we display good manners um, as we do those. So please keep your microphones on mute. Um, use the chat box for questions only, please. Um, and like I said before, Amy, Curious and Anya will be watching and bringing forth those questions to us. Uh, we don't want you to miss out any of our agronomy funds. So remember to be respectful participants as we have our um, manure Monday today. Now, I'm gonna turn it over to Chrisis and uh, she's gonna give us our next piece of our afternoon. So here you go, Chrisis. All right, and Brian, you're controlling the slides for me, right? Yes, I am. Okay. So, welcome to Manure Monday once again. And we'll dive right in here. So we all know uh, manure as a good plant food, right? It's a good fertilizer, it helps plants grow. But it wasn't always used for that. Um, back in the 1800s when pioneers were settling in the Great Plains of the United States, like you know Kansas or Missouri, that sort of area, they didn't have a lot of trees growing there at that time. And so their you know, main source of warmth and um, ways they cooked their food was with fire. So you gotta burn something, right? So they would collect manure and um, buffalo manure specifically. So they walk around with these wheelbarrows and go collect buffalo poop and then dry it into bricks and then burn it. So <laughs> let's all be a little thankful today that we don't have to go walk around and collect poop to heat our homes or to eat food. So that's just a little perspective, you know, in all these times. Uh, next slide, Brian. And like I said, manure is a great fertilizer. It's a great plant source and it provides the three uh, most important nutrients that plants need to grow. And that's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And that's abbreviated N, P, and K. And nitrogen is really important for the leaf growth of the plant. That's um, where the plant gets energy from the sun. So the nitrogen helps create the chlorophyll, which helps collect that sun energy. And then phosphorus really helps grow the other parts of the plant. So like the stems and the roots, um, and then the fruit of the plant, which could be a corn cob or a rosebud. Um, and then potassium um, is really important for the digestion and creation of that energy from that chlorophyll. So the sun hits the chlorophyll, it creates energy, but then the plant has to use it somehow. So the potassium really helps with that. So manure is a great source of all three of these nutrients. There are other nutrients that plants use to grow and manure does supply those as well, but these are the big three. Next slide, Brian. But all manure is not created equal. So how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is in manure depends on a whole host of things. So animal type, um, what type of bedding you're using, if you're using bedding, even what you're feeding them, how much um, water they waste, if they spill their water in their bed, anything like that. And that's kind of what this table here is showing. You've got animal types down the left there, um, like you know, swine with bedding versus no bedding. And then the dry matter is if it's considered a solid manure or not. Generally, if it's over 
13% dry matter, we consider it solid and you would be able to stack it up in a pile on your farm. Um, and then next to that is how much estimated nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is in each manure type um, in pounds per ton. So you can see they vary quite a bit across, you know, from swine down to duck and alpaca. Um, and if we look through and kind of scan through and try to find the most nutrient dense, which, which manure has the most nutrients per ton, we look and we find that it's actually turkeys. And you wouldn't really think that it's turkeys. I mean, they're just, they're just birds. I thought it would be, you know, beef or dairy or something, but it's actually turkey. And you may have seen turkey piles of manure in fields waiting to be spread. They're the big brown dry piles looking in the fields. And that's because it's such a great fertilizer source. And Minnesota is actually the number one producer of turkeys in the country. So we have a lot of turkey manure to spread, which means we have a lot of valuable nutrients to use in our fields. All right, next slide. Unless you wanna check for any questions up to this point, Chrisis? Oh yeah, we can do that, sure. Any questions on it, Amy or Kirsten, before we move on? We we don't. don't. Have... No. Oh. Okay. We'll continue. It looks like we do have one that just came in. <laughs> Why does bedding matter for their manure? So bedding, for the most part, is another plant material, right? So you're using it could be corn stalks, it could be straw, wood chips. They all kind of came from a plant, and that plant has its own nutrients that it's bringing to the. Um, to the manure because it all gets mixed together and you're not going to separate that bedding out before you put it on the field. So sometimes it can absorb some nutrients. There's a carbon to nitrogen reaction that can happen where if you have too much carbon, like wood chips have really, really high carbon, it'll tie up some of that nitrogen so then you'll have less for the plants to use. Okay. But it's not all rainbows and butterflies when it comes to manure. I, you know, it's a great fertilizer source, but there are some challenges that come with it. So one of the biggest ones that we worry about is water quality. So when manure um, runs off or the nutrients dissolve and run off or seep down into the um, groundwater or into surface water, that can be a problem for the quality of that water. In surface water, we worry mostly about phosphorus um, in fresh water and it can harm the, the uh, fish and aquatic wildlife that live there. You know, Minnesota, we really care about our water here, right? We're the land of 10,000 lakes. Um, we actually have closer to 14,000 lakes, but we're called the land of 10,000 lakes. And so we want to protect those and keep those clean. And then um, the nutrients seeping down into groundwater, we worry a lot about the nitrogen and especially nitrate. And 75% of Minnesotans get their drinking water from groundwater. So we also want to protect that, right? This slide here is showing the nitrogen cycle. So it's just showing how nitrogen changes and moves throughout the environment down into the soil, up into the atmosphere. I won't get too much into it. There is also a cycle like this for phosphorus and also potassium, but we won't get into that. I just want you to see that um, newer nu nutrients are used and recycled through the environment. And that's kind of what our activity today is going to be about. Next slide. And we'll get into that right now. So these are the supplies that you're going to need. This was up, this is the same slide that you saw right at the beginning. And so we will dive into that right now. Um, Brian, if you wanna stop sharing and make me big on people's screens. So if you're not, if I'm not big on your screen right now, um, if you go to the top right corner of your of your screen, it'll say either grid view or presenter view, and you want to be on presenter view. So you want the person that's talking to be nice and big in front of you. All right, we're gonna tilt this down. You can get a good look at my hands and the paper towels that I've spread out over here. I always wanted to be a hand model. Okay, so um, the materials we need are a three cup piece of Tupperware. Now you can use something that's bigger than this, something smaller, whatever works. Three cups seems to work well because then the size of the sponge you're using, which is six by three and a half inches, it works well to wedge right in, right in there while it stays off the bottom, but wedges nicely in. So this is what we're gonna use for our waterways. This is what we're gonna use for our soil. 
So a sponge is a good representation of soil. Water kind of gets in between the cracks, just like it does in soil, and kind of holds there. It can get too wet where water would drain away through the bottom. That could happen in soil as well. So we're going to use a sponge for our soil. You also need a drinking straw. This is going to be our well. We're going to make a well on this little farm that we're making. Also a spray bottle full of water. Powdered drink mix is going to be our manure. So I've got red Kool-Aid here, but it could be really any powdered drink mix. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the red kind. It can be like those, the crystal light powder, that sort of thing. I think, it, I think even hot chocolate would work fine for this. Just something that will dissolve in the water and that you can see moving. And then also we need a spoon, of course. A scissors. And then paper towels for the mess we're going to make. <laughs> um, we will be, when we spray the water, I'm just gonna say right now, maybe be a little ways away from your computer. I almost destroyed my work computer the other day when I was testing this out by getting a bunch of water all over my work computer. So um, we'll do the spray bottle in a little bit. You know, take a step, step back from your computer. Mine is covered in paper towel right now to try to avoid that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is create a hole for our well. I talked about that well, which is our straw. So kind of toward the end of the sponge, maybe right about there in the middle, we're gonna cut a hole. Now, be careful while doing this. It's probably best if an adult does this or an older child or something like that because I don't want anybody getting cut. So we're gonna do that first. So sometimes I find it easier to just kind of pull it over. And then okay, Chris, see say thank you froze on us. As we're waiting for Chrissy's to come back, you can see she's demonstrating cutting a hole for her well. Oh, and hopefully she'll be back shortly. So in the meantime, um, I will let you all know that we're doing this again next week. We have our um, Tractor Tuesday next week. So you can put that in your calendars and we'll be giving the date out afterwards. I know Christise will be joining us back here shortly. Uh, I see a question mark in the chat. So if you just want to hang tight, I'm sure she'll be right back in. And as you're thinking of this experience, you can also um, think about how you want to exhibit this at the fair. This would be a great thing that would go under plants and soil science or water and wetlands. So once Christise joins us again, that's, as you're thinking of a fair exhibit maybe, you could put that under water, wetlands or plants and soil science. And Sarah, maybe I'll pull on you again. If you just want to um, share with us maybe some 4-H uh, projects you're in, just give us a couple. I see Christise has rejoined us. So if you just want to tell us some of the projects you're in as we get Christise back up here, that'd be great. Sure. So I am in, uh, this will now be my 12th year of 4-H. So I've done a lot over the years. Um, I've done a lot of general projects. One of my favorite general projects that I found was Wright County Historical Society kind of sponsored a research for the summer of researching ghost towns 
in our area. So I got to dig into the history of my town, Monticello. That was a really fun summer. Um, my main one, always been throughout the years, is I show sheep. Um, so my family runs a flock of sheep. I started that in, I do believe, third grade is when I started showing sheep in 4-H. So I've been doing that for many years. I spent about five years in the rabbit project. And I think Chrisius is back. So hopefully we can get going again. Right. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Chrisius, welcome back. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> internet on a call three times in my life. One was on last week when Brian and I tested this out. Another was during a random call. And of course it has to happen now. So I'm really sorry. My internet went out, but it came back. You guys should have this whole cut by now, right? <laughs> While I was frantically trying to get my internet to work. You know, these technology gremlins today, I tell you what, they've been something. Okay. So now that you've got the hole cut, you're going to put your straw through that hole, like so. And then we're going to put the sponge inside of our container and kind of wedge it in there so that it is not totally against the bottom and it's kind of hovering there. Now, I think it's really round, so with these corners, I think I'm just gonna lop off these corners so that it'll fit better in my container. So, Kersia says you're doing that. We had a question in the chat. Do we need a, um, to use a big sponge or can we use a small one? And as I'm watching you, you would need one that would kind of fit in your container, correct? Yeah, but you could get a smaller container. You could use uh, a one cup, a two cup, Tupperware container, whatever works for you. Um, your pond just might be a little bit smaller, but that is just fine. So here we have our farm. Maybe I'll prop it up a little bit here. So we've got this big empty space. This will be our pond. This is our surface water. Um, you could also think of it as a lake or a river or any other surface water type of thing. And then this is our land. This is our farm. Um, we've got our well here. We can cut off all this extra straw, maybe like a half inch above. You don't need that. So like that. And now we're going to fill the, our pond with water here. So now you want to bring the water up so that it's to the bottom of your sponge here. That's why we're kind of hovering in midair. So do that now. You might want to run to the sink. I have a measuring cup with water. Okay, and if it starts soaking into your sponge, that is just fine. It's all good. Um, so now our farm is set up. We've got our farm going here. So what you see the water underneath the, our land, that would be the groundwater. And then the water that's over here would be our surface water. So now we're going to make some stockpiles of manure on our farm. Where should we pile manure so that it's not going to impact and hurt these waterways that we have so close to our our farm. So our manure, remember, is our drink mix. So get your spoon and your drink mix and make a pile right next to the water here. Oh. Doesn't have to be big, just a little pile of manure. Okay, and now the fun part. We're going to make it rain with our squirt bottle. That I'm gonna not get all over my work computer. <laughs> oh, the splatter pattern is lovely. And with the Kool-Aid, it, it makes a nice uh, array across my counter. It's very nice. This is why I recommend being in the kitchen because if you're on the couch, I have a gray couch and it would be dyed red with Kool-Aid at this point. But you can see what happened, right? Our manure ran right into our waterway, right into our pond. 
Now, the fish and the wildlife in that pond aren't going to be very happy about that. Um, they're, and you probably won't want to swim in that pond either <laughs> at that point. So, because it got all pink and the manure just ran right off the land into the water. Okay, so the next pile we're going to make is going to be by the well. But before you do that, dump out your red water. We want to get clean water in here again. Okay, I had to rinse mine out because I had a big chunk of um, manure that ended up there. So we're gonna put our, try to put our next manure pile right next to our well here. Maybe if I put the well on your side, that'll be better. There's our little manure pile. And then we're going to make it rain again. Maybe if I have it a little less aggressive, that's more aggressive. There we go. Nice mist. Nice downpour, you know, something we could use right now. And look, once again, we have pink water. And that's because the Kool-Aid, our manure, took the path of least resistance. So it took the easiest way out and went straight down around where that well was dug and into the water below. Now remember drinking water is important, or groundwater is important for drinking water for many Minnesotans. So we want to um, keep that clean. So maybe that wasn't the best place to pile the manure either. So now we're gonna do one more spot so reset your farm one more time, get clean water in there, uh, maybe scrape off some of the manure piles as well on your sponge. So do that quick. Okay, I'm back. It's also super interesting to pick up your land, how the manure permeated down into the soil from the surface there. You can see that it not only ran off the surface, but it also soaked down into the soil. So, now let's pick a good place to put this manure, shall we? Let's, let's use a little um, sense from what we've learned here. And let's put it, you know, right in the middle. So far away from our pond, far away from our well, that sort of thing. Um, let's put it, you know, right there. And once again, let's make it rain. Okay. You got any pink water? I don't. Um, yeah, so put in your manure pile far away from what we call sensitive features. So which uh, a sensitive feature would be like um, a waterway or a well or a sinkhole if you have one of those or even a tile intake. So um, that would be the best place to put manure. Now in Minnesota, we actually have some rules about this you can't put a pile that close to a well. Um, the, the, we call them setbacks. They're the rules of, that Minnesota have that um, say how far away from a sensitive feature you can put a manure pile. Like um, you can't put it with a, within 100 feet of a well or within 300 feet of a lake. So we couldn't have put it right there either like we did. Now, of course, those can um, vary by county. So you might be thinking like, oh, well, you know, it's. Ours is a lot stricter than 300 feet. Well, in 
the Minnesota rules are the minimum, the base counties and townships can be more strict than that. Okay, so one final thing I want you to think about is um, what if this, what if the ground was frozen or saturated with a lot of water? So if your sponge was frozen, do you think that there would be more runoff or less runoff from the manure? Probably more, right? Because there isn't that good infiltration that you see because some of our manure that first time went straight down. So that's you know better than running into the water, but if it was frozen, it wouldn't be able to do that. Okay. I think we're ready to move over to questions now. If you guys could see the red splatter, this would be great. <laughs> so one of the questions, Chrissy's, is um, what about floods and floodplain areas? Yes, uh, Minnesota also has rules about putting manure storage piles or even applying manure <clears throat> in floodplain areas. So they have this thing called the um, like a like a 25 year flood or something like that, where if there's a chance it floods in that area, you can't put a manure pile there. You're not supposed to. And if there, if you live in an area where pretty much, you know, your whole yard or whatever is a floodplain, there are some things you can do. There's some water diversion tactics where you can build up berms or catch basins so that you control where that manure runoff runs and it gets caught there and kept there. And then um, you can safely use that. Okay, any other questions? You can type them in the chat. Maybe as we're waiting, Christie's, what about if they would purchase manure at a store? Um, any recommendations or thoughts as to, they should think about if they decide to purchase manure at a local store that they have? Right, yeah, S the same concept applies. A lot of the manure that you buy has been composted. Now, I've just been talking about raw manure here. So, you know, the poop plus the bedding stacked up in your yard. But if you compost it, if you go through the process of stacking it up and turning it and, um, you know, making sure it's watered enough or it has enough moisture to heat up and you're doing all the right management things, it, there's a lot less chance of nutrient runoff because the nutrients in compost are a lot more stable than in raw manure. Now, uh, something I hear a lot is, um, does fertilizer also act like this? And yes, it does. So you might hear, you know, don't over fertilize your lawn with phosphorus or something like that because if it runs off into the, um, into the gutter and then to a sewer drain or something like that, it can end up out in the environment. Or um, farmers applying fertilizer on their field kind of have the same thing to think about with um, runoff because it also, the nutrients dissolve if they end up in a lake, they're going to cause the same problems that manure does. Okay, here's another question. Um, is spreading manure on a garden different than piling it? Do the same rules apply as for a distance from a lake or a well? So like if we were going to use it in our home garden? Yes. Um, the application setbacks are the same as storage setbacks for the most part. There are some um, intricacies, but um, if you're spreading manure in your garden, there's also some safety things you want to um, deal with, especially if you're, you know, eating the produce or that sort of thing. If you put it on tomatoes, you want to make sure that um, you're not, first of all, putting on too much nitrogen, that'll burn your tomatoes, but also, um, you know, there could be pathogens in the manure and you don't want to um, eat those pathogens, so you got to make sure you wash your fruit with fruit or vegetable really well. You gotta make sure that you um, are putting on the right amount. But for the most part, I see in gardens is compost once again, which is a lot more stable than raw manure and a lot easier to control and you won't burn your crops or your garden plants with too much nitrogen with compost. Okay. Does something happen to manure when it's warm versus cold? To find something, yes, uh, there's, there's a lot of processes going on in manure. Manure is just full of microbes, right? It's full of little 
bugs that you can't even see. And they're breaking down the nitrogen, they're converting um, nutrients to other forms of nutrients. And in the winter, just like us, you know, we don't like to be out in the cold. Those microbes don't like it cold either. So the microbes like it nice and warm. So they'll work faster and they'll be more vigorous in, when it's warm in the summer rather than in the winter. Also, there's sometimes you can lose some of your nitrogen to the atmosphere as a gas. That happens a lot more rapidly in summer, kind of like evaporation does than in winter. Okay. Um, how long does it take manure to be composted? Ooh, that depends. Depends on how well you manage it. <laughs> um, I, I, I know people that make a pile and turn it, you know, once a month, once every other month. Then it's going to take, um, you know, months and months to do. But if you're diligent about it, if you are monitoring the internal temperature, and when it hits 160, you turn it, whether that's a week, whether that's two weeks, something like that. You can have good finished compost in 60, 90 days. Okay. And then another question, do similar rules apply to pesticides as to piling manure with the groundwater, I assume? So I'm assuming you're thinking like herbicides and um, insecticides and that sort of thing. So those have their own set of rules on what you can and can't do because um, they're more of a, a chemical that works against plants and insects and that sort of thing. I don't know the specifics on what those rules are, but they don't have the same setbacks that manure has and fertilizer. Is, is um, manure from a cow, pig, or chicken better? So between the species, I mean, it depends on what, what you need and what you're looking for. And manure is the, the, the forms of nutrients in manure are the same regardless of animal species. But how much is there and how much is available to the plant right away really depends on the animal species. So if you want to you know, put on a lot of manure and you want the nutrients to be available right away, um, sometimes swine manure, pig manure is better than say a dairy cow because swine manure with what they eat, they have a higher protein diet. And I'm trying not to get too much into chemistry here, but proteins are mostly made of nitrogen, right? So that you end up with more nitrogen in the manure because of what they eat. And dairy cattle, on the other hand, eat more plants and um, have, they have more of a fibrous manure. Like when you drive past a, a swine barn, you can really smell that, right? It is just, it gets in your nostrils. But dairy manure doesn't really smell that bad. Then that's the nitrogen. I mean, I don't think dairy manure smells bad. I think it smells kind of good. But <laughs> um, that's the amount of nitrogen that's there. I don't know if you're going to get Minnie to agree with you on that, Chris. Oh, come on. It's not that bad. <laughs> um, what's better um, for plants, dry or moist manure? I don't think it really matters. Uh, moist manure tends to have more readily available nutrients than the dry manure, but then sometimes we call the dry manure a slow release. So then it'll, it'll release for a longer amount of time to give the plants, you know, nutrients for a longer amount. But if you need a lot right now, then moist manure. Um, back to the temperature, does the distance rule change with winter? Yes, it does. So Minnesota rules increase almost every feature to 300 feet in the winter. So if you're um, applying manure, on top of frozen ground or on top of snow, which sometimes in the state is necessary because we have such a long winter, it's not recommended because your runoff is much, much higher than during um, spring or fall, or if there's an active plant growing, that's the best because then the plant can use it right away. And winter is just kind of sitting there for a while. But yeah, the setbacks increase to 300 feet, which is quite a bit. And if you have a bunch of tile intakes in a field, 300 feet away from that, on all sides be a challenge. How good is rabbit manure? 
Rabbit manure is real good. I used to have some rabbits back in my 4-H day and we used to spread that. Um, and it's got a really high nitrogen content. It's right up there um, with turkey litter. We don't talk about it as a super high nutrient content a lot because I work with mostly farmers and I don't know a lot of rabbit farmers that you know, farm at a commercial level. Um, so turkey manure is what we consider great for, for big operations, but yeah, rabbit manure also has a really, really high nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium content. Is it bad if my chickens poop right in the garden? Ooh, so that is a, it can be a food health, food safety issue, which I'm not part of that team. We do actually have a food safety team, but it can be a concern if you're walking around and picking up that blueberry and just popping it in your mouth. That might not be such a great idea. Right. If you wash your produce really well, that sort of thing, it'll help, it'll be good. It can still lead to foodborne illnesses though. Okay. So definitely make sure we wash everything. Yes, wash really well. Does manure work well on grass like it does on other plants? Yes, it does. So, I mean, corn is technically a grass, right? We just make it big and strong and makes a big ear of corn on it, right? But it's, it's a grass. Um, wheat is also a grass. We use manure on that all the time. You could totally use it on your lawn. It would, your lawn would be absolutely beautiful. <laughs> But, you know, you might want, not want to sit in that lawn, roll in that lawn, have a picnic in that lawn with manure all over the place. Christy, I'm going to throw a question out here and then we'll, I think, kind of start wrapping it up a little bit. Um, as young people are hearing about you and your knowledge here, um, we've got positions like this in extension. Can you tell us a little bit about your um, college career, how you became um, into this position? Yeah, so like I said, I did 4-H from uh, Cloverbud all the way up through high school. Um, Brian was actually my county uh, coordinator back then, so I've known Brian for, he's known me since I was like four years old. Um, and then I went um, to school for agronomy. I went to SMSU down in Marshall and then I went up to NDSU to get my master's in plant pathology, which is just plant diseases. So I would just make plants sick and die for a living. It was a great time. And then I hopped the border and came back here to Minnesota, to the University of Minnesota, to work with manure, another really fun topic. I just, I'm into the morbid topics, the killing plants, the manure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Christy. Um, Anya, Amy, Kirsten, any la last parting questions before we start to um, we we do have one that some people might be wondering about. Um, what about dog manure? Can that be considered fertilizer? Or is that harmful to plants? Just like uh, any other animal manure, it would still help plants. Um, I don't know about you, but where my dog has, you know, pooped in the yard and it has stayed there for a little bit and the rain has washed the nutrients down into the, into the grass, the grass looks really nice there. <laughs> but, um, it putting it on your garden is also a food health risk. I want to make right. that clear, right? Same as the other manures. All right, that's kind of it for our question. Okay, great. So, so they, thank you. There oh, was, oh. I think there was one. The you already asked this one. Will the runoff be high because of the spring melting? Yes. So. They estimate almost half of all the runoff that happens in a year happens in just two months, February and March. So the amount of runoff from fields is huge in those months when snow is melting. It's the worst time to apply manure. Thank you. All right, thanks Chrissy, and thanks for all the great questions. Um, so as you think about what you've learned today, Think about bringing this to the county fair. Um, you might think, okay, where does this fit if I um, enroll this in, into the fair? This would be a great idea for plants and soil science or for water and wetlands. You could create an exhibit on applying manure as fertilizer in fields that would help yields. You could do a comparison of manure versus other fertilizers and which should maybe be more environmentally friendly. Uh, you could also research um, what kind of manures could be in fertilizers for gardens and this could be a display or poster. So again, think about that plants and soil science or water and wetlands 
to exhibit um, to our county fairs. I'm gonna put a poll up here, and then once I do that, I'm gonna remind you all of our next week's um, session. So here's the poll. Um, you can fill it out as you're listening to me here. Uh, next Tuesday, May 19th at two o'clock is our Tractor Tuesday. So make sure you make plans to attend our Tractor Tuesday. Um, learning about some of the technologies and changes in tractors as, as they've been applied to farming. Um, and I really hope that you've learned something new today. And if there's parents with us today, if you're new to 4-H, you can sign up with us. Uh, we have uh, online newsletters that we can send that gives us the most update um, information and our programs that we're offering. So please, uh, you can check that out. And I would really encourage you to enjoy, um, to um, join us again next Tuesday, May 19th at two o'clock for Tractor Tuesday. So thanks for joining another offering by our 4-H Agronomy and Horticulture team. Again, I want to thank Sarah Welts, our Minnesota 4-H Ag Ambassador, for being with us today, and Christise Moderman, our Extension Educator in Manure Nutrient Management, um, that was with us today as well. So thank you for joining. <laughs>